not sure how many of you were, I forget who was here last week, um, but Chris preached on Acts 21. Uh, but that, uh, the sermon from last week was actually a follow-up to one that he had preached a couple of weeks before that. And his first sermon was about the Jerusalem Council. And that was the council when the, when the church was trying to determine what parts of the law that Gentile Christians needed to follow. So do they need to be circumcised? Um, did they need to follow all the dietary restrictions? Um, basically, how exactly would they be included in this new movement that was really at the time kind of a, just another sect of Judaism? Um, and at this council, the leaders landed on a few regulations. So Gentiles should refrain from what the text says, uh, just says, um, they should not, they should refrain from blood, which is kind of vague, but in Chris's interpretation, that meant bloodshed or violence. Um, they shouldn't eat food that had been sacrificed to idols um, or polluted by idols. Um, and they should refrain from sexual relations outside of marriage. Those are the big ones that uh, the Gentile Christians needed to follow. And in his follow-up last week, um, Chris looked at chapter 21 of Acts. Um, and in that chapter, Paul agrees to go through this Nazarite ritual, which was outlined in the law. Um, and he did this as a way to show that he did not think that the law itself was wrong or evil, um, just that without the person of Jesus and Jesus's death and resurrection, that the law was insufficient. Um, so after the sermon last week, in our question and answer time, um, we talked a little bit about Jesus's way of interpreting the law um, and his answer to a very common question of the time, which was, um, what is the greatest commandment? Um, or, you know, if you had to, how would you sum up the spirit of the law or the main thrust of the law? Um, and Jesus's answer was um, probably pretty common knowledge for us. Love God with your whole self um, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as I was trying to decide what to talk about today, um, our discussion from last week was still kind of rattling around in my mind. Um, but I was also thinking about the sermon from July 3rd um, and kind of our country's social and political situation, right? With um, so much animosity um, and the question of, you know, in our current context, what is our role as Anabaptist Christians? Um, and this question that Jesus has asked, what is, what is the greatest commandment? And his answer, it kind of struck me as um, a good place to focus our attention. Um, and so I'm going to read Luke's version of Jesus's answer to that question. Um, and actually, you might notice that the question he's asked is slightly different, but I think the main thrust is essentially the same. So this is, this is Luke 10, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, also passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal 
brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more that you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So I think we're probably all familiar with that story. Um, and I'm also guessing um, that maybe we've all been taught that the Samaritans and the Israelites um, had a notoriously bad relationship with each other. Um, when I was reading, as I was reading up on this parable over the last week, um, I came across some details about the Jews and the Samaritans and their relationship um, that really brought to life how bad it actually was. Um, so I wanna share some of these examples um, because I think it's easy maybe for us 2000 years later without really a very good understanding of the culture of that time. I think it's easy for us maybe to minimize uh, the hostilities between those two groups. So the Jews thought that the Samaritans were descendants of people that the Assyrians and other kingdoms brought into their land to try to colonize um, parts of Israel. Um, so Samaritans, they were monotheistic like the Jews, um, but they only accepted the Torah or, or the Mosaic law as legitimate scriptures. So they didn't consider the prophets or anything like that as, as true scriptures. Um, and very importantly, they believed that the true temple was um, not in Jerusalem, but it was on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And last week we talked a little bit about the importance of temple theology for the Israelites. Um, it was huge. So this was a huge disagreement and conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. Um, has anybody heard of the, uh, of the person Josephus? Probably some of us. What's that? Oh, yeah. Um, so Josephus was an ancient Jewish Roman historian. Um, and he wrote a history of the Jews. Um, and his writings, he says that the Samaritans laid waste to Jewish land and even actually would kidnap Jewish people uh, for the purpose of making them slaves. Um, Another famous um, Jewish high priest named uh, John Arcanus, he was a Maccabee, you may have heard of the Maccabees. Um, he actually besieged Samaria um, because he hated them so much um, and completely destroyed the city by digging underneath it and it fell into the river. Yeah, um, and he removed all signs of it having been a city, including destroying the Samaritan's temple. Um, now, the Samaritans also um, attacked the Jewish temple. Um, so during Passover one year, they, they went into the temple and they scattered human bones in it to desecrate it on like the highest of high holy days. Um, and that actually happened when Jesus would have been about eight or nine years old. So he probably would have remembered that. Um, so those are just a few details about the history between Samaritans and Jews. Um, which should inform how we read this parable. Um, so you can imagine that this parable and it's sort of surprise ending with the Samaritan being the, the moral example, um, that probably made some of uh, the listeners really, really angry, um, especially because Jesus contrasts the Samaritan with Jewish religious leaders um, and especially temple workers, right? Priests who worked in the temple, Levites, also temple workers, um, and Jericho, where the, where the beaten man was attacked, um, or on the way to Jericho, Jericho was where a lot of priests and Levites lived because it was close to Jerusalem and they could uh, get to the temple easily. Um, so Jesus is not avoiding this controversial topic of the dueling temples. And I think um, this story has a lot to say to us 
especially right now, in light of all the conflicts um, and hatreds that are saturating um, America. Um, and I, I'll tell a very, very short personal story. Um, a couple weeks ago, I, I played in a band and some of the uh, some of the band, actually all the band members except myself live in Wisconsin. So we were trying to find a place to rehearse between where we all live. And one of our bandmates has an old friend um, who offered to let us use his garage as a rehearsal space for free. Um, and so we drive out into, it's in the country in Wisconsin. And um, when I walked into the garage, the first thing I saw was like, a bunch of signs, some of them very belligerent, um, in support of a very divisive, and in my opinion, destructive, um, dangerous political figure. And I have very, very strong opinions about this person, this political figure. And, and I started to think, um, do I really wanna be in this place? Um, it's given me bad vibes. Um, and I continued to have negative thoughts um, while we were there about this person whose house we were rehearsing in. Um, but then I read the parable for this week. And it struck me that um, if I were if I were a Jewish person living in first century Israel, um, that guy who hosted us would have been a Samaritan to me. Um, someone I vehemently disagree with. Um, and he had done me a favor. Um, and I was having trouble accepting that favor from him. And so after reading this parable, I felt, at first I felt very convicted. Um, but then I realized the parable, I felt convicted, but it also gave me a very strong sense of clarity. Um, so in the parable, Jesus, he doesn't comment on the rightness or the wrongness of the Samaritan's beliefs whatsoever. Um, no doubt, Jesus did not believe that the Samarian temple was the true temple. He didn't believe that. And I'm sure he had feelings about things that the Samaritans had done to the Israelites, right? I think Jesus may have even disliked Samaritans in general. We don't know. But that is not the point. Uh, the point is that when it comes to loving other people, right, when it comes to being a neighbor, choosing to be a neighbor, those things don't matter whatsoever. When it comes to God's demand that we love our neighbors as ourselves, um, and even further, that we choose to be neighbors to our enemies, right? That's exactly what the Samaritan did. Um, and Jesus holds him up as a positive example. And I think the purpose of Jesus's parable, when you, when you really get down to it, is that there are absolutely no boundaries to who we are called to be neighborly towards um, or to show love to. We don't get to decide who to show love to. Um, and that's not a new message for us by any means, right? We've heard that over and over again in church, right? It is a simple message, but it's not an easy message. And I think it is the perfect message for our time, um, for this time, when we're, when we're being encouraged to dehumanize and discount our enemies. And I know we don't like to use that language, or we don't like to think that we have enemies. Um, but I don't think it does us any good to deny that that's how we feel about certain people. Loving our enemies, um, or choosing to be neighbors to our enemies. I don't think it's simply about doing the right thing. It's not about personal morality, um, if that makes sense, right? It's not it's not just a, a question of um, a simple question of like doing the right or the wrong thing 
it's, it can also be a, a form of evangelism, actually. And I think it might be the most powerful form of evangelism um, because it's a way to witness to the kingdom of God. Um, it's a way to witness to the transformation that Jesus offers us through a relationship with him. It's Jesus who, um, who gives us the power to be neighbors to our enemies. Um, it's a way to witness to the truth of who Jesus was and is, right? Um, when we love our enemies, um, it validates Jesus's ministry, right? It makes it real now. Um, and it brings life in the here and now to his death and resurrection. In the Gospels, um, Jesus, is, you, Jesus uses miracles as one way to reveal his authority and his identity, right? It's a way to persuade people. Um, and I truly believe that when we, like, like the Samaritan from the parable, when we draw near to our enemies, uh, when we choose to be neighbors to them, even, even if they wouldn't do the same thing for us, that's important, right? But when we do that, that that is actually a kind of miracle um, because I think it defies nature. It defies human nature and our natural inclinations. Um, and it reveals the possibility of God's redemption and kingdom. And so I'll simply say, um, like Jesus says, let us go and do likewise.